Hello. Um, so we're going to go through three slides. So you should have three index cards ready. Um, we're continuing on um, in talking about elections and how they are impacted by uh, various factors. So you should have these three cards. When you're finished, you have several assignments to do um, for practice. Like there's three of them. So please make sure you get those done. There's a quiz on this material and then some practice on some other things. So make sure you do that. All right, so 5.13, incumbency advantage. Go ahead and write that. And at any time, if you need to pause to write, that'd be great. It's probably better to pause, write, listen to my uh, commentary real quick, and then move on to the next one. And we'll make it pretty quick. Make sure you listen to everything because the extra commentary that I give you kind of explains it and it'll help you learn it better. Okay, here we go. Incumbency advantage, backside. First, we need to define what an incumbent is. So incumbency comes from the word incumbent. So flip over. An incumbent is simply an official currently holding office. An incumbent is an official currently holding office. So if you're running from for re-election, like President Trump will be, then you are an incumbent. You are currently holding office. Again, always pause it if you need to, because I'm going to move on rather quickly. Um, most presidents, by the way, win re-election since 1916. So that means that most incumbents win. Like incumbents, like there's an advantage to being an incumbent. And uh, I'll get some factors in a second, and you need to know those factors really well. So make sure you study them. But the reality is most of the presidents win re-election since in the last 100 years. Um, only Hoover in 32, Herbert Hoover, that was Great Depression. Ford in 1976, and that's kind of weird, kind of an exception because Ford wasn't actually ever elected. Remember Nixon, if you don't know, he had a vice president, Spiro Agnew, who resigned in disgrace before Nixon. And then Ford got not named as his VP after that. And then Nixon himself resigned. So then Ford became president. He had never been elected on a ticket. So kind of an exception. So I don't know that he counts really in this. Carter in 1980, Bush in 92, all lost as incumbents. All had bad economies. That's something really to keep track of. The fact that the economy of the United States was bad is one of the major reasons why they lost. And then you don't have to write this, but you see the winners down below in the last 100 years. Woodrow Wilson, Calvin Coolidge, um, Franklin D. Roosevelt, three times as an incumbent one because he won four times overall. Uh, Truman, Eisenhower, Johnson, Nixon, Reagan, Clinton, Bush two, and Obama all won as incumbents. And, uh, and let's look at the reasons why incumbents win. Um, there are several advantages to be an incumbent. Several advantages as an incumbent. Uh, name recognition and fundraising are chief among them. Just being known it helps you win, uh, win votes, especially people that are more moderate, who maybe aren't really in tune with politics, and they just kind of become, you become familiar to them. So therefore, that helps you, especially in primaries, because a lot of times people in primaries like are not well known. And so like, for example, Joe Biden right now, um, you know, he's helped by the fact just name recognition alone helps him. Fundraising ability, you have connections, you know people, you're the person in power, you can raise more money. Uh, media attention, obviously being the incumbent, being the person in power, you know people in the media, you have media connections, you get more attention. Oftentimes, if you're the incumbent, you don't have a primary opponent, so you're not like duking it out for uh votes in the primary like joe biden elizabeth warren bernie sanders all of them have to kind of fight each other and trump like gets to have no primary opponent effectively and so like it's easier for him he doesn't have to spend all the money he can save the money for the general election next fall whereas the democrats are spending millions and millions of dollars you know flying around to different primary and caucus states right now you know trying to get votes uh or of the office that just means that like the office has like a sense of power and dignity. And so like just being the person who holds that power kind of gives you, you know, uh, you know, kind of a, a, an advantage. So so Trump, he is president. So therefore, you know, he seems to like be the right person to be president. Whereas like maybe a new person like Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, they've never been in a position close to that. So like you kind of just, maybe you don't see them as president. Now, Vice President Biden, I mean, he probably 
has some aura because he already was VP, which also helps him. But like some of the other candidates, like they, they, you know, Trump has an advantage because he is got this aura of president. Um, voter risk aversion. Like the reality is, if things are pretty good, people usually just reelect the people that are in office. An incumbent just wins. And risk aversion is just why should I elect a new person if the person in office is doing a decent job? So that's going to be the real question next year. Do people think Trump's done a good enough job? Or is it time for change? Okay. Candidate-centered campaigns. Um, as a result of primaries, candidate-centered campaigns have become the focus. I think we already mentioned this once before, but now it has its own card. Primaries have led to candidate-centered campaigns. You might need to pause because I am going to move on pretty quickly. Um, and because of primaries... The parties have lost power. They no longer get to select the candidates who run. So now people are fighting against each other in primaries for attention. And that means that personal qualities end up becoming much more important than, you know, your party support, your part, your port, your support for the party platform with a lot of peace there. Um, so, for example, some examples of personal qualities that have mattered in modern, modern day. JFK was Catholic. He was the first Catholic president. So there were a lot of Republicans who were Catholic and they voted for JFK because it was like this exciting moment where America was going to vote for someone who wasn't Protestant. And so that became kind of a big deal. Reagan, uh, Reagan had uh, name recognition. He was a former actor, then uh, became governor of California. Um, he, and he had really great speaking ability. He was very, very funny. Uh, Reagan made fun of himself, uh, and, and people liked the fact that he was kind of jovial and, um, and he kind of used that to win election. Uh, President Obama, there's no question that in 2008, people were really, really excited uh, to vote for a, the first black president and, and hopefully put behind, um, there was like this idea that, that if we vote for Obama, that will kind of put behind racial tensions that America has kind of gotten over, maybe some of its past, uh, that'd be very arguable that maybe that didn't happen. Um, so, but, but there was a lot of excitement in 2008. Um, it was just a funny thing about like personal qualities mattering. There was so much excitement of Obama. You see the article on the right here, um, that Obama nearly like every time he went somewhere in 2008, like there were always people like fainting in the middle of his, uh, speeches. And that was just kind of an odd thing that kept happening, but it just shows like people were, you know, this kind of almost a little bit of, a, of around all of these people, there was a little bit of a cult of personality where like everybody's just like, oh my goodness, this person is the greatest um, because personal qualities matter. Lastly, obviously Trump, um, you know, he's a TV personality. He used to have a TV show called The Apprentice that was, I think, a number one show in its time slot at one point. Um, even when it wasn't number one, Trump always said it was number one. <laughs> But um, yeah, so he he uh, used that and, and was it was well known and had a big name recognition just from that reason. And and what's happened is is that popularity in these elections has become more important than issue stances. You know, now it doesn't matter so much like what your platform is or what the different issues are. You know, just for your average voter, like, hey, do I like them? It becomes more important than what, how do they, what do they feel, or what is their position on healthcare or taxes or such and such and such. Um, this has been intensified. This popularity has been intensified by mass media coverage. You know, as the 20th century moved on, we went from radio, and then eventually had TV, and those things meant that candidates were vying for this media coverage. And uh, people could see and hear the candidates uh, almost on a daily basis. And then in the 21st century now, um, we have even more intense use of social media, especially Twitter. And by the way, Obama was the first president to use Twitter. And uh, Trump, of course, has used it as well for good or ill, depending on your um, perspective. All right. And that's that card. Next, party messaging has become an important part of campaigning. And the idea being here that you're trying to get out your message to win over different groups, because if you don't get enough groups together, you're going to lose. So especially after you lose an election, you then sit down and say, okay, what message needs to be different? So um, party messaging means you modify policies 
You know, I'm going to change what we, we say about tax. I'm going to say, change what we say about environmental regulation. I'm going to change what we say about health care in order to appeal to various demographic groups, uh, whether it be different ethnic groups, um, gender, so on and so forth. Can't watch those videos. They won't show up on the video. Sorry. Um, communication technology is used to get out the message. So, you know, YouTube now and social media sites are now a huge part of trying to get the message out. And so you might watch some video on YouTube. And if they have figured out that like the video you watch is more likely, you're more likely to be a Democrat voter if you watch that or this other YouTube video you watch um, about something else is more makes you more likely to be a Republican. Well, all of a sudden, guess what? Boom, boom, boom! Here comes an ad from one of the parties, and so they've got that to peg. They they've got that figured out. Uh, voter data management. So that's like information they have on you as a voter, how often you have voted in the past, and by the way, they can get that information from the local um, registrar's office. Um, also, just. Um, finding information on you because of the internet and cookies and the fact that websites will track your data and what you shop and what you buy and what you look at what sites you visit so like oh they go to conservative sites oh they've been to a liberal site they then will buy information from these companies and they use that information to target you notice the word disseminate underline that word disseminate and above it put the word spread so they try to spread um, their messages to you based on um, different places that you visit and uh, your voting um, regularity. It's, it's kind of creepy, honestly. And then outreach and mobilization efforts. Remember to outreach just means literally to visit voters. And so, you know, they want to visit as many voters as possible. One of the videos I had that, that you really can't hear when I do a video this way was about uh, Democrats and Republicans in Nevada, like literally going door to door to try to get people to come out and vote. And that's also known. So outreach is the act of going and visiting someone. Mobilization is the act of encouraging them to vote. So remember, mobilization, um, these things all have to center around the message of the party. Because when you get to someone's door and they actually open it and talk to you, like you have a chance to talk to them and that message better be um, done well or you lose that opportunity. Okay. That's it for the uh, video. So if you would go ahead right now and uh, st stop a minute, put the three cards in front of you and practice them on your own, study them because you're gonna take a quiz on them soon. So if your partner is done, you both can quiz each other. Thank you.